Secondly, please try, please move up. That way we know exactly how many people are attending the lecture and you know, I can see the number of empty rows. Also, the people at the back are not visible to me when you're sitting way back. Don't forget your name tags, let's start. So we're going to continue with this business of uh, training neural networks. Specifically, uh, we are going to be dealing with the issue of optimization. Now, what we've seen so far, again, uh, we recorded a second lecture on Monday afternoon. That lecture has gone up on YouTube and should be up on MediaTek as well. Ideally, you'd watch, watch the video on the Media, Media Tech website, once again, so we can keep track of who's watching it. But if, in any case, please do watch that uh, lecture. I'm assuming that you watched the lecture today, but I'm going to go over some of the key, the key bits because I'm afraid I wasn't particularly clear uh, in that particular lecture, which was taken at nine in the night. So uh, uh, here's the story so far. What we've seen is that neural networks are excellent universal approximators. They can model any odd thing. They're chameleons of the uh, computational world, provided they have the right architecture. We must train, we must, they don't just model anything, we must train them to approximate whatever function we want them to approximate. And for this, we specify the architecture and training essentially means learning the weights and the biases. Uh, can you shut the thing, please? Yeah, thank you. So, and the way we train these networks, we train them to minimize a loss on a training set. And we do this through empirical risk minimization. We use variants of gradient descent to do so. And, uh, what, and in gradient descent, we need to be, able to be able to compute the gradient of the error that the, net, the network makes using the current set of parameters. And the gradient is computed using an algorithm that I may or may not have uh, formally uh, given you the name for in the previous class. It's called back propagation in the sense that you actually compute the derivatives of the error with respect to the parameters by traveling back through the network. So a recap again, here's what gradient descent does. You have some ugly function. You want to find the location where the function is a minimum. So you start off with some initial guess and then at each point, at, e at each uh, guess, you find the direction in which the function is decreasing. So if the derivative of the function is positive, then you have to take a step back because the function is decreasing backwards. If the derivative is negative, you have to take a step forward because the function is decreasing in the positive direction. And so this very simple algorithm will act eventually fire, take you to a local minimum. If you're training a neural network using gradient descent, you start off by defining a loss, which is the average divergence over the training set, uh, where the divergence is computed for each training instance and quantifies the error between the actual output of the network given the current, uh, uh, the, uh, the current set of parameters and the desired output of the network. The way we perform the training, we initialize all of the weights, all of the parameters, and then simply apply gradient descent where the gradient is computed, computed is for the loss with respect to the parameters. You compute the gradient and then keep adjusting the parameters against the direction of the gradient. Now, this of course means you have to compute the gradient of the loss. The gradient of the loss is simply the average of the derivatives of the divergences for the individual training instances. So this term here must be computed which is the derivative of the divergence for each training instance with respect to the parameters. And uh, we saw how we do this in class and in the extra lecture, we, I also explained how we would do this using a vector formulation. So in the vector formulation, you just arrange all of the, since we are speaking of layered networks, you would arrange all of the variables in any particular layer into vectors. So the inputs, if it's a d-dimensional input, the inputs x1 through xd can be arranged into a single d-dimensional vector. The affine combinations that, that uh, uh, arrive at the input of each activation function within any layer, so those are the z's. Those z's in turn can now be arranged in a vector. 
the activations, the outputs of the neurons in any layer can also be arranged in a vector. So you have a vector x, which is the vector of inputs. For each layer, you have the vector z, which is the pre-activation affine variable arranged as a vector. You have the vector y, which is the post-activation output arranged as a vector. You can also now write a matrix out where each row in the matrix is simply the set of weights going into any given perceptron, any, per, any given neuron. So the first row in the matrix over here, WK, the subscript K means that this is the matrix of weights attributed to the kth layer. And uh, so the first row is the set of all weights going into the first neuron of the kth layer. The second row is the set of all weights going into the second neuron and so on. Similarly, you can also define a bias vector, which is simply a vector of the biases for all of the neurons. Once you do so, the computation for the, for the forward computation becomes very trivial. So consider the computation for a single layer. Now, if I'm given all of the, if I'm given the vector of outputs for the k minus month layer, the affine variable for the kth layer is simply the product of the weights matrix for the kth layer and the y vector for the previous layer plus the bias for the kth layer. So that's this guy over here. And this basically writes the entire mess of equations that we wrote down in the last class in one single vector formulation. And then once you do so, the output of the kth layer is simply the activation applied to the affine variables. You guys at the back, do you mind coming up front? I can't see you at the back, right? And uh, don't forget your name tags. So now that we know exactly how to write down the computation for a single layer in a trivial way, then the actual forward pass becomes a very simple algorithm. You would initialize the, uh, the input layer as just the input itself. And then you go through the layers. For each layer, you first compute the affine variable by multiplying the weights with the output of the previous layer and adding the bias. So it's an, it's a, it's an affine equation uh, over vectors. And then subsequently, you compute the output of the layer by applying the activation to the affine variable z. And you keep, so you compute zk and then yk. And then now that you have yk, you just go to the next layer and then compute zk for that layer again and then the y. And once you've gone through all of the layers, the output of the final layer is simply the output of the network. So this is very straightforward. When you write the entire thing in matrix form, the computation is trivial. And there are many benefits to working with matrices. First and foremost, most of the libra libraries you're going to be working with are matrix libraries, which are very efficient. And it's going to be far more efficient to be working with the matrix formulation than looping over variables. So which is why not only is the written arithmetic very convenient, it's also practically much more reasonable to be doing this. So here is the pseudocode for the forward pass. You initialize the input, input layer, and then for, you step through the layers and for each layer you compute, iteratively compute the affine variable vector and then the activation vector, right? And now, once you've gone through the net and you've computed all of your variables, you have to compute your derivatives going backward. So you'd start off at the very output, you have your divergence computed. And then if you actually go through the lecture that I, rec that I recorded on Monday night, so you'll see here's how you compute it. In the first step, you're going to compute the derivative of the divergence with respect to y. Now, before I go continue over here, there's something that I must point out. So when we go back a few slides over here and look at the uh, equation for the update rule for gradient descent. So observe that xk plus 1 is xk minus some step size times the derivative transposed, right? What does this tell you about the shape of the derivative with respect to the shape of x itself? Anyone? Mayak, what did it say? The, the shape of the derivative is going to be transposed. So whenever I have a scalar function, some function y equals f of x, where this is a scalar and this is either a vector or a matrix, then you're going to find that the derivative of y with respect to x is going to be the shape is going to be x transpose. 
right? Which is why when I actually write the update rule, I have to transpose it to make everything fit. And that's how I can write the update rule. Now, this is something you must remember. And this is something that you will always be using to verify that all of your variables are right, because then you can check the dimensions, right? So if I go back here, uh, when I compute my backward pass, the very first step, I'm going to compute the derivative of the divergence with respect to the outputs. So what is the shape of this derivative going to be? Is it a column vector or a row vector? Manual. Will this, be a, this, will this derivative be a column vector or a row vector? Mm -hmm. Yes, because y is in our, the way we thought of y, y is a column vector. So the derivative of the divergence with respect to y is going to be a row vector of the same size, correct? And so now once you've computed the derivative of the divergence with respect to the output, observe how the computations happen. When you do everything in vector math, this is so convenient and easy. Then I take a step back and compute the derivative with respect to the affine variable z. When, that, when I do that, what happened? All that happened was that I took the previous derivative, which was, which, which was with respect to y, and post multiplied it by the Jacobian. And the shape of the Jacobian, of course, is going to be the size of y times the size of z, right? And so this is going to be the size of y. This is going to be the size of y times the size of z. So what is the result going to be? Is it a row vector or a column vector? And what will the length be? The length of z. So you can see that this is actually matching, correct? So now this is going to give you the length of z. And then once I've done this, I can take a step back again. And now I compute the derivative with respect to the previous y's. And when I compute the derivative with respect to the previous y's, all I have to do is to <coughs> post multiply the previous derivative, which was with respect to z, by the weights matrix. So every time I take a step back, it's just one matrix multiplication. And once again, if you actually write down the shape of the weights matrix, you're going to find that this is the shape of y, z, and y. So when you multiply the two, you're going to end up with a row vector, which is the size of y, the dimensions fit. right? And so you can keep working your way back. Every time you go back one layer, all that happens is when you go past an activation, you post multiply the current derivative by Jacobian. When you go past a layer to the, to the previous layer, you post multiply the current derivative by a weight matrix. And so it's a very simple, convenient operation going all the way back. But then this is not the only thing we're really trying to compute. What we really want is the derivative with respect to the weights and the biases, right? So you can do this on root. So when I compute, while I'm computing the derivative with respect to z and y, in between, I can also compute the derivative with respect to the biases and the weights. Now the biases are the same size as the number of neurons themselves. So the size of the bias matrix vector is the same as the size of the z vector, correct? And so, you, so it turns out simply because we have this equation z equals wy plus b, right? So the derivative with b is going to be the same as the derivative with respect to z. And so you have this equation over here. Now what about the up equation above? So here is something else that you will find. If I have a vector y, I have a matrix w, which zaps it to a vector z, and then I'm computing a scalar divergence from z, then the derivative of this divergence with respect to w is simply going to be y times the derivative of the divergence with respect to z. Again, if you go through the lecture, you will see that we actually make this explicit statement. And what is the derivative of the divergence with respect to z? It's already been computed, right? It's a row vector. And y is a column vector, right? And so what is the size? What is this size? What is the size of this computation? This is the derivative of the divergence with respect to w, right? What is the size of this computation? Is the size of y times the size of z, right? And what is the shape of w itself? It's size of z times size of y. So this is going to be the transpose of the size of w. So once again, you see that the dimensions fit, right? 
But the really cool thing about all of this computation is that I can just keep going backward and each time I go backward, all I'm doing is post multiplying the current, current derivative by a matrix. And in between, I have this single simple thing hanging off the side, which gives me the derivatives with respect to the bias and the weights. And so the entire backward computation can be written by the simple algorithm over here, which is that you initialize the derivatives with respect to the output. And then as you go back at each step, you are going to just keep post multiplying first by a Jacobian and then by the weight, and then by the Jacobian and then by the weight as you keep going back. And between layers, you're just going to pause to compute the derivative with respect to the weights and the biases, right? And so here is the entire backward pass going back. This is basically the same code uh, algorithm just written in the form of pseudocode. The questions, anybody? Doubts? No. And so we have a very interesting trend. Two classes ago, I had 120, three classes ago, we had 120 people in class, then we had 100. Then we had 80, today we have 60. Four classes from now, I'm going to have to go out on the street to bring students in, right? <laughs> so uh, I hope to see more in the next class. If I'm here, I expect you guys here. Okay, anyway. Uh, so here's the overall training algorithm for training the neural networks. You'd initialize all of your parameters, then you go over your entire training data and for each training, day, training instance, you're going to compute the output y. I don't know if by shadow this goes down, right? So you're going to compute the output y. You can compute the divergence with respect of the output with respect to the desired output. You compute the derivative. And then you aggregate these derivatives because eventually you want to compute the average derivative, right? Once you've gone through the entire training, day, training set, then you can go back through all of the parameters and update your parameter values for the gradient descent rule using the computed derivatives. So if you were to set up for any problem like say digit recognition, then uh, in the case of digit recognition, if your problem is say is that of determining if this is the digit two or not, then the output is binary, it's either a zero or a one. So you'd have a lot of training instances of twos and other digits which are not twos, all labeled with either zero or one you would have a network of the kind shown to the right where you have a single output, which outputs the probability of the digit two. You define your divergence, which would be the kullback leibler divergence over here. And do you, why did we choose the KL divergence as opposed to say the L2 error? Anybody remember? Faster optimization. Faster optimization. The L2 error was much too shallow, right? And uh, then you can just use backdrop. If you were using, if you were performing uh, multi-class classification, it's going to be the same kind of setup, except now you have class labels. And your output, your network is going to have a vector of outputs. And your desired output is now going to be a, what would the desired ve output vector be? And it's going to be a one hot representation. And then you can compute your KL divergences, your cross entropies, and uh, perform back propagation, right? So this sort of summarized everything we've seen in the past class on Monday and previously. There are some issues to deal with, convergence. How well does this whole process actually learn? So we saw that when you're using the gradient descent, you eventually want to keep taking steps and get to the optimum, but there's this question. When you're taking steps, you're not really getting there in one step. You're taking there one step at a time. How long is this going to take? And will you even get there, right? So there's this issue of, uh, there's the question of convergence and issues like once you get to an answer, will this generalize outside the training set? We are not going to be dealing with uh, bullets two and three today. In the next few classes, we're going to be dealing only with bullet one. So let's move on. So first thing, we've shown, we started off by talking about uh, a perceptron which had a threshold activation. We had a network which was a multi-layer perceptron, which was a network of perceptrons with threshold activations. Then we said that this network cannot really be trained for any given input data because threshold activations and errors are not differentiable, right? So what did we do? We made two changes. What was the first change we made? We changed the activation to something that was differentiable. We made another change, which was 
we replaced the counting of error with a divergence function, which was also differentiable. And now the whole thing could be differentiated, and you could, you could uh, uh, optimize the network, right? Does this really work? Does this give you the answer that you really want? We have to answer the question because things have changed. What we really wanted to do was to minimize the error. We've changed everything in between. We've put in this soft differentiable function. We've changed our definition of the error. So does this still give you what you want, right? And how fast will it get to what you want? What are the rates what are the, at which it gets to, what to, to the correct answer? What are the restrictions? Uh, we'll look at a bunch of topics. I won't actually read those out. Let's start with the question. Does back propagation always give you the correct answer? So now there are two different issues going on over here, right? The first issue is that I have changed my definition of error. My loss is no longer the error, it's the average divergence, right? Do I now I am trying to minimize the average divergence. Will minimizing the average divergence give me the lowest error? So, meaning even if I actually solve the gradient, the function optimization problem that I'm trying to solve, am I going to get the answer I want? So, maybe if that's not very clear to you, let's look at this. In classification problems, the classification error, as we saw, is a non-differential function of the weights. And so we, computer, uh, we sort of computed proxies for, for the activations and the error. We uh, used an, which we used a divergence, which is a proxy for the, for the classification error. And we used the softmax or some other activation, which is a proxy for the threshold. And this is what we're actually trying to minimize. Which means that minimizing this loss doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to minimize the classification error. To give you an idea of how this works, uh, there are many more slides in the slide deck. So you'll see that the slide number just jumped from, uh, what is this, 25 to 35. This gives you a clue as to which slides the quiz are going to refer to, is going to refer to, which are slides number. 26 to 34, okay? But here, let's look at this training data. I have all of these red dots, I have all of these blue dots. Are they linearly separable? Yes. So now let's consider two cases. In the one case, I'm using a threshold activation function and I'm applying the perceptron rule. In the other case, I'm using the sigmoid and the divergence and I'm using backprop. It's just a single perceptron, but it's, I can use gradient descent. That's also, you know, I'm calling it backdrop, right? So will the perceptron rule find me an optimal classifier here? Clearly, the things are linearly separable. And what about uh, back, backdrop? You would expect to find a nice, beautiful minimum where the solution lies. And so the backdrop is probably going to give you something like that red line as the decision boundary between the two classes. And that red line is the global minimum. That is where your the, the divergence, the loss function actually has a minimum. And now I add this one little dot. One more training instance. Will, back, will, will the perceptron rule find the classifier? It's linearly separable. What about backdrop? So here's what you stop and think, right? Those clumps of red and blue dots. I could have thousands of those dots. How, my, how much new data did I add? One, right? What is the influence of one more point going to be on the loss function? Basically nothing, right? All insignificant. So what will backdrop do for me? It's probably going to wiggle that answer a little bit, right? Backprop is still, that, that would be a local minimum. If I bound the weights, which is a good thing to be doing, for even with, if I say that the length of the weights vector can never exceed one, there is an answer that the perceptron rule is going to find. But backprop, it's not going to do so, right? It's going to find this other minimum, which is just a little wiggle from where you were. And that is going to be a local minimum, right? Or even a global minimum. So. Let me, let me change the training data. Let me add instead this training data. Once again, what happens? The perceptron rule is going to find me a boundary. Backdrop, not so much, right? So 
Now, as I keep moving, if I just keep adding this one spoiler, in each case, the perceptron rule is actually going to be able to find the decision boundary. The backdrop is simply going to be wiggling the original boundary a little bit, which will misclassify that new spoiler. Because the spoiler is not contributing a whole lot to the loss function, which is being computed from thousands of points. Right? So what this means is that even though the solution exists, backprop for classification, backprop may not find it, not because your optimization failed, but because that is not the optimum for the loss function that you're actually minimizing. Make sense? Right? And so what's happening here? Just adding one training instance can make the perceptron rule change its solution wildly. Backprop is not going to do so, right? So in other words, the perceptron rule always finds the solution. It, does, it makes the fewest errors. It has low bias, but it has a tremendous variance. One, changing one instance can make the solution swing around crazily. Backprop, on the other hand, is going to have a bias in that it's not going to be chasing every little training instance. And so as a result, the solution can actually, the answer can actually be off. But it's not going to swing around wildly as well. So it has low variance. And in the machine learning world, we like things with low variance. We like to believe that just because you added one more training point, you're not going to end up in a different region of the universe. So the fact that the backprop solution is not chasing your answers is, uh, uh, so guy at the back, can you turn off your phone? What's this gentleman? behind you. Okay. Can you turn off the phone, please? Yes. Right. So unless you are going to that URL, that's the only reason you're allowed to turn your phone on. OK. So this is not a bug. Backprop features consistency over perfection. That's not a bug. It's a feature. Right? Now, that was for yes. So the potential cause of bias in the sense that uh, you're not, there does exist a solution. You're just not finding it in terms of classification error. So that's the bias, right? Your error is not going to be, you're going to have a bias. The error has a bias. It's not, the expected value is not necessarily zero, right? So, yeah. So what is, what is it you really want the network to perform? The, the loss function is a proxy for something else, then not necessarily, right? So it's a question of what it is we want to minimize. So I can always come up with proxies which give you absurd answers, and the bias, there would be no bias. So the same thing over here, right? That was just for one perceptron with a linear boundary. If I have a, a perceptron, a multi layer perceptron, it's actually going to curve your boundaries, as we will see. And even here, the same thing holds. I might be able to get a perfectly perfect decision over here, but then if I just add one little training instance out close to the blues, my network is not going to swing around and capture this new shape. It's going to try to stay consistent. So it's going to have low variance. So in summary, backprop will often not find a separating solution, uh, even though the solution is within the class of functions learnable by the model, which is what we are really computing the bias with respect to, right? And this is because the separating solution is not necessarily a minimum for the objective being uh, minim minimized by, the, by, by backprop. So one resulting benefit is that backprop trained neural network classifiers have lower variance than an optimal classifier for the training data. And this is good when you're trying to look at data outside of your training, training set. So first, we sort of established, is, is that the clock? Oh, perfect. So that uh, uh, we are, uh, we are, backdrop may not actually be doing what you think it should be doing. But maybe that's not a bad thing, right? But still, what it actually does is going to be dependent on the loss function that you're minimizing, correct? And that loss function is a surface. 
and you're trying to find a minimum for that surface. What does the surface look like? Now, uh, in all of the things that in the, in the little example that I gave you, I assume that the loss function has the shape where it has a single unique minimum and you're trying to find it and that you can find it. The, uh, and the statement that we made about variance, et cetera, is just assuming that you actually found that global minimum. That's not what's going to happen. The loss surface is going to look something hideous like the figure to the left where there are lots of little valleys with their own minima, right? So in that case, how is it going to perform? So what does the loss surface itself actually look like? So uh, there are many hypotheses. We don't really know. That's the problem. It's a very complicated system. So uh, there's uh, one common hypothesis is that in large networks, you have many more saddle points than local minima. Local minima are local valleys. Uh, and uh, that the frequency of saddle points is kind of exponential in the number of variables, parameters in your network, which is the network size. Another says that you might have lots of local minima, but they're all equivalent. If you actually find the value of the objective function at the local minimum, they're all going to be more or less the same in all of the local minima. This is for large networks. So this doesn't really hold for small networks. Now, what do I mean by a saddle point? Does anybody know? Yeah, Rana? Yeah, that's, he gave a mathematical definition for it, right? But pictorially, a saddle point is a point that looks like a saddle. <laughs> so that's why, that's why it's called a saddle point. So you see the bottom, of, that looks like a horse's saddle. If you go in one direction, the function is going up. If you go in the other direction, the function is going down. Each of the figures, above figures, are also instances of saddles. If you look at them just right, they basically look like the figure at the bottom, right? So depending on which direction you're looking at, you might think you're at a minimum or at a maximum. So uh, the hypothesis is that, and the slope is zero. So if you're using gradient descent, you could actually get stuck over there. The uh, uh, hypothesis is that neural network, uh, the neural network loss function has many of these. The lady back there, could you mind, would you mind shutting your laptop? Yeah, thank you. So uh, that uh, there are lots of saddle points in the loss function that the, the uh, optimization could get stuck at. Question. Yes. So why would you stop at the saddle You're just following the gradient. You keep coming down, and then when do you stop? The derivative is zero, right? So if I'm doing, if I'm upgrading, updating by the derivative, the derivative value is zero. You're going to stay there. Uh, uh, you can still go in down uh, in one of the directions. So if the derivative is zero, it's flat. It's flat. It's just that. Well, so if I have something like this, right here, the derivative is zero. In the other direction, if it's like this, right here, the derivative in the other direction is also zero. So the fact that it increases or decreases really has to do with whether you continue walking after the derivative has gone to zero. And that's why you will get stuck, right? So there are many, many hypotheses about this loss, loss surface. And uh, here are some Baldi and Hornick. Hornick is the guy who came up with the universal approximator theorem. Uh, he's, they say an NLP with a single hidden layer has only saddle points and no local minima. They have some math behind it. Dauphin has this, uh, says an exponential number of saddle points in, a, in large networks. Ch Chomoransk, I think that's how I pronounce it, uh, uh, says that for large networks, most local minima lie in a band and are equivalent in that the actual value of the function is the same in all of them. But that's based on an analyzing spin glass models. Uh, Schwartz et al. say local minima in, uh, in, in networks of finite size, trained on finite data, you can have terrible local minima. Uh, they aren't really contradicting one another, but what this really tells you is that we really don't have an idea of what these loss functions look like. And expect to see a lot more papers on this subject. Someday we'll figure it out. There are some more recent papers which show that uh, for very large over-parameterized networks, the loss function may be almost convex and so on. So, yes. How much is it to get stuck at the subject point? I mean, it's just one direction that you get stuck. Uh, there, you know? So the point is, if you, if, you, if you look at this figure over here, uh, it's, you're looking at two dimensions. A saddle point may actually be fairly flat in many directions falling off in some, you know, it gets very complex, so you cannot really say. 
you get a better idea from the figure on the top where you see how the saddle point is really something you could get stuck in. Right? So, uh, anyway. So, yeah. Uh, what do you mean by in a band that uh, tight is the most local minimal line in band? So, in some local spread out region of the okay. input space. Okay. Yeah, that's it. So, the story so far neural networks can be trained via gradient descent that minimizes a loss function. Backprop can be used to derive the derivatives required for gradient descent. Backprop is not guaranteed to find a true solution even if it exists and lies within the capacity of the model to, model, model to represent, right, or the network to model. Because the optimum for the loss function may not be the true solution. And for large networks, the loss function may have a large number of unpleasant saddle points or local minimum. So, so far so good. We know that even if you get to the flat region, firstly, if there's a global minimum, that may not be solving the classification problem your training data represents. Second, the local minimum may not be the place you want to be in the first place. Third, how fast are you going to get there? Even ignoring the first two topics. So that's the issue of convergence. So now in the discussion that we've had so far, we've assumed that it arrives at a local minimum, but does it always converge? Does it get there in a fine number of steps, right? So now it turns out this is really hard to analyze for an MLP with really, really complex loss functions. So we will uh, do something called, we are going to use that, look at it through the lens of convex optimization. We note we understand convex functions. So this is a case of what I will call the street light effect. How many of you have heard this joke? I mean, everybody has, right? Some guy loses his uh, keys in a pub and the policeman finds him searching for them near the street light. And he asks him why, and he says, it's dark in the pub, here's where the light is. So you're not really worried about where the keys fell, you're worried about where you can see. And because you have a better chance of finding the keys here than in the pub. Anyway, uh, we know how to understand, interpret convex functions. So we're going to look at the world through the lens of convex functions. Specifically, we're going to look at a best case convex function for gradient descent, namely, quadratic functions. First, what do I mean by convergent? What do I mean by convex? Now, a function, I will say a function is convex, is there an eraser, if this happens. If I can take any two points above the function or even on the surface of the function and just connect them up with a line, and if the line never actually intersects the function, I'm going to call the function convex. Similarly, I'm going to call a set convex if I can take any two points within the set and connect them up and the connecting line doesn't go outside the set. So you will see that uh, the two figures on the top, they represent convex functions and convex sets, the figures at the bottom right. The function is not convex because there are these two points above the function when I connect them up, the line slices the function. So also I have the con non-convex set because the set curves, I have two points within the set when I connect them up, the line goes outside the set. So these are not convex, right? And now, what do I mean by convergence? Remember that uh, when we perform gradient descent, we start from some point, take a step, take a step, take a step. And as you keep taking steps, eventually you hope to get to the optimum. If that happens, we say the algorithm has converged. But you can have other things happen, right? You can keep taking steps, and then your step is so large that your solution is here, you overstep it. Then you say, okay, I gotta go back, and then you overstep it. You can keep jittering around without actually arising, arriving at the minimum. You can do something even worse, you, because whatever strategy you use to choose your step size is wrong, you may actually step across and say, oops, I've gone the wrong way, and then take an even larger step and bounce off, and eventually just diverge from the answer. So these are three different things that can happen. So what are the conditions for convergence? First, let's try to sort of quantify convergence. And this is typically quantified using something called a rate of convergence. So let's say my optimal solution is near that wheel, and if I'm currently here, I am some distance from the optimal solution. After one step, I'm a different distance. So the ratio of the reduced distance to the original distance, that gives me the factor by which I have gotten closer to the solution, right? 
And so, if this factor is constant, meaning at every step, I'm 0.9 closer to the solution, then we will call this linear convergence. Now, although we call it linear, it's bad terminology because if you really think about it, in k steps, I'm going to get 0.9 raised to k times closer to the solution. So you're actually getting that exponentially fast, right? Now, this is a kind of uh, convergence, yes? Yes, Daniel? Um, but you don't know what the solution is. No, you don't. Are you, uh, are you capturing the different theoretic gradients? So uh, we're just speaking of the theoretic. We can show that for convex functions, if you, do, if you perform gradient descent, this happens, right? without actually knowing where the solution is. So uh, we won't get through the math of this. We're just speaking of the rate of convergence. This is just a con theoretical concept, right? For con quadratic functions, this is always going to be feasible. You can get there. Uh, the convergence for convex functions in general, you can have linear convergence. Now, let's begin considering quadratic functions. What is a, so this is important. The quadratic function basically looks like this, which is, I'm going to use the half there pick for convenience. It's half E W squared plus B W plus C. So this is my function F. So what is the derivative of the function with respect to W? What's this gonna be? Pardon me? A W plus B, it's the equation for a plane or a line, right? And what is the second derivative? That's just A, that's just this constant, right? So what can you tell me about, now remember a quadratic can be going upwards, it can be going downwards, right? So what can you tell me about whether this quadratic is going up or down based on the value of A? If A is positive, the second derivative is positive. So the whatever, wherever the derivative becomes zero has to be a, a minimum, right? If A is negative, the second derivative is negative. So wherever the derivative becomes zero, it's got to be a maximum, right? Something that you have to keep in mind. Now, uh, so I can just use a gradient descent rule. And so, now that's a quadratic. For a quadratic, I can always solve for the optimum directly, right, in one step. Everybody remember how you solve for the uh, optimum for a quadratic? It's minus b plus or minus square root of b square minus 4ac by 2a, right? So, do you remember that? Right? So, so, you can solve for it. But I can also do this using gradient descent. I can stop, start at any point, compute the derivative, take a step against the derivative, take a step against the derivative, I'm going to get there in some time, right? Now, if I do that, I'm going to use the gradient descent rule up there. So let's work this out. So let's say I have half AX, AW squared plus BW plus C. That function looks something like this, okay? And this is my current guess, and I have some derivative, and the derivative here is pointing downwards, so obviously I have to walk in this direction. What is the optimal step size for me to get to the solution? An optimal step size is a step size in which I can get there in one step, right? So the optimal step size must get me from here straight to here, correct? Now, how would you comp compute the optimal step size? Turns out it's very trivial. How many of you are familiar with uh, uh, Taylor series? Everybody must be familiar with Taylor series. Who, doesn't, who hasn't heard the term Taylor series? There are some people who have both heard it and haven't heard it because they haven't raised their hands, but anyway. So, uh, uh, the guys at the back, you guys are sleeping. You have to wake up, or maybe you have to come up front. So. Uh, yes, you lady, I need your name tag. Where's your name tag? Yeah, so everyone has a name tag. We had the, we made those, right? Yes, yes. 
So that way I can invoke you by name and I don't have to call you lady. Uh, not that you aren't, but still. Anyway, uh, uh, this is, uh, so now how would I actually compute the optimal step size? Now, let's say I have this play point, WK, right? What is the Taylor expansion for this function going to be? What is the Taylor expansion for any function? So if I say I have an f of x, I want to expand it around some x0. What is the Taylor expansion? f of x0 plus f prime at x0 times and then half of f double prime of x0 times x minus x0 squared plus, and then I have the higher order derivatives, correct? Now what is special about the Taylor, Taylor series expansion? If you stop the Taylor series expansion after k terms, the k first k derivatives of the resulting expansion are identical to the first k derivatives of the function itself at that point, right? That's how you actually arrived at that expansion, right? And that's the property of the Taylor series expansion. Now, what would the Taylor series, how many terms would the Taylor series expansion for a quadratic have? Milk? Three. Three. Why? Because after f double, double prime, right? So you can have the zeroth order term, the first order term, and the second order term, right? And that is that going to be an approximation or is it exact? It's exact. It's a quadratic. I found it perfectly, right? So now, what is the Taylor series expansion of this? Where did I put the? Duster, right? So what's the Taylor series expansion of this function going to be? I want to find the Taylor series expansion at WK, right? What is the Taylor series expansion going to be? Jachen? F of WK plus F prime WK, right? times w minus wk, right, plus second order wk, w minus wk squared. Is there some, something missing here? There's the half, right? And this is exact, because this is a quadratic representing a quadratic. You cannot do better than that, right? Now, where is this function going to be a minimum? How do I solve for it? How do you solve for any functions minimum? When you, what, what do they teach you in school? Take the derivative and equate it to zero, right? What is the derivative of this guy? With a derivative with respect to what? W, right? So what is the derivative of this guy? That's f prime wk, right? Plus two over two of f double prime wk times w minus wk, right? That equals zero. That's what you solve for. So I can take this off here. I can take this guy off and I can say f double prime wk inverse. And what is this term? That's simply a, remember? The second derivative of the quadratic is always a, right? And so this gives me w equals what? What's it going to be? Wk minus f double prime wk inverse f prime wk. Right? If I just write this equation down, I'm going to get to the solution in one step. Very clear to everybody how I got to that. Anybody who didn't get it, right? Anybody who didn't get it? No, OK. Now compare this to the equation up there, the gradient descent equation up there. Can you tell me the optimal step size? Basically, this is simply because this is the same equation as the gradient descent, right? So if eta equals this one, then I'm going to get to the solution in one step. 
So for a quadratic, there's a one-step solution that actually gets to the optimum. Everybody get that, right? OK, fine. Beautiful. So because everything that we talk about is going to depend on this. This is a, just a slide recapitulating exactly what we just derived, that if I have a step size, which is the inverse of the second derivative, which is a, then I'm going to get to the, regardless of where I start from, I'm going to get to the optimum in one step. Okay. What happens if, so I have this function, and if I take a step which is the second derivative, I'm going to get here. What will happen if I take a step and the step size is less than the second derivative, inverse of the second derivative? What will happen? If, I, if the step size is less than this guy, it's going to go here, it's going to go here, it's going to go here, it's going to take some time getting here, correct? But it's going to get there monotonically. What if the step size is greater than the optimal step size? It's going to shoot right past and go here and then go here and then go here and you know, it's going to sort of wiggle down to the solution, right? Is there a bound on how large the step size can be before things, are, things go bad? What happens if the step size is equally exactly equal to twice the optimal step size? It's just going to go straight across, and then it's going to come here, and then it's going to come back here, and it's going to keep bouncing across. If it's more than twice the optimal step size, it's going to begin climbing up the hill, right? Instead of going into the valley, it's going to walk out. So uh, there's a very clear idea of for, of for, for quadratic functions. The optimal step size is the inverse of the second derivative, which is the A in our case, right? Okay, so this is basically a slide explaining exactly what we just uh, understood. Now, if I've got, that's for quadratic functions. Suppose I have a generic function which is kind of smooth and nice and has a nice optimum, then I can still write the, expand the sec, this function in terms of using the Taylor series and use a truncation, second order truncation. And if I do, what is the optimal step size? It's just the inverse of the second derivative. If the step size is less than the inverse of the second derivative, you'll expect to go to the solution monotonically. If it's greater, you'll expect to bounce back and forth. If it's more than twice as much, you expect to not converge, but to diverge, okay? Now that was for one, a function of a scalar. What if I have a function of a vector? Now for a vector function, meaning w is a vector, I can still write a quadratic, but now the quadratic formula is going to be slightly different. It's, it's going to involve matrices. So for a vector, here's what you're going to find. This has to happen twice every class. Now, here's what you'll find. You're going to say f equals now, I kept this half so that when I differentiated the two and the two cancel out. So we generally try to like to write it with the half. It's just a scaling constant, right? And W transpose is going to have W1 through W whatever D, right? Times A, which is going to be a matrix times W. Plus, and then you're going to have W transpose, which is W1 through WD times B, which looks like so, B1 through BD plus a constant. This is still a quadratic. Every term is a second order term, right? So this is, multi, this, this is for multivariate inputs. And just for the sake of convenience, I'm going to consider the case where A is a diagonal matrix. So when A is a diagonal matrix, now, first, look at what is this. This term is simply going to be summation i, w i, b i. It's an inner product, right? So the second term is straightforward. When A is a diagonal matrix, then I can write this as half W transpose. Now, this is going to be A1 through AD, or A11 through ADD, right? 
and this is W1 A11, W2 A22, WD ADD, right? If A is a diagonal matrix. So which in turn simply becomes summation I AII WI squared. So if A is a diagonal matrix, the entire equation can be written like so. It is half summation AI I WI squared plus summation I WI BI plus C. Or I can write this summation, take this summation out I and I can say half A I I W I squared plus W I B I plus some C I. So basically I've written this as a summation of many quadratics, independent quadratics, specifically when A is a diagonal matrix, okay? This, I'm doing this only for the sake of illustration and convenience so that I can show you the figures and things will make sense. And so if I have, for example, if I have two dimensions, in this case the function f is going to be half a1 w1 squared plus b1 w1 plus c1 plus half a2 w2 squared plus b2 w2 plus c2. So I can write this as a sum of two quadratics, each one defined on a different variable, only for uh, for the two-dimensional case when A is diagonal, but everything that we are speaking of will generalize from this simple idea. So consider the 2D case. What is the figure going to look like? That is a bowl. It's a quadratic. If I take level sets, meaning if I slice the bowl at different heights, each of the level sets is going to have an outline, and the outline is going to be an ellipse, right? And so if you look at it, it's just going to be a bunch of concentric ellipses when you look at it from the top. Now, if I take different horizontal slices, what is the shape of the horizontal slices going to be? Horizontal slices, right? So basically, when I'm taking different horizontal slices, it means that I'm fixing each slice is basically considering different W1s. So basically, I'm changing one of the terms and keeping the other, other, other uh, uh, equation constant. So if I take, say, different, uh, if I take, this thing looks like so, and it's the sum of quadratic one, computed at W1, and quadratic two, computed at W2. If I fix W1 and make it a function of W2, all I'm going to get is a bowl, right? Because this becomes a constant. If I take different values of W1, I'm going to get different bowls, but all the bowls are going to look identical. They're just going to be shifted in height, right? So in other words, if I take all of these vertical slices are going to be the same bowl at different heights. So also each of the horizontal slices are going to be the same bowls at different heights, right? So it makes sense? Now, how does this actually, uh, uh, matter to us. Now look at this figure, right? This figure is a bunch of concentric ellipses, which is with a narrow in one direction and wide in the other direction. So if I take the function, the, ver uh, uh, the uh, function ag against the vertical variable, that's going to be, say this is y, that's a vertical variable. This is f, this is going to be a bowl. Will this be a wide bowl or a shallow bowl for this figure? If I take a vertical slice, what kind of a bowl will it be? It's really big, right? It's going to be wide. So this is going to be something like this. As a function of x, is it going to be wide or shallow? Or wide or narrow, right? It's going to be narrow, right? So for x, it's going to be something like this. Make sense? Right. So now, here. So here are the functions across, across the two, two different variables, x and y. 
Now in the first case, what is the optimal step size? It's going to be, this is going to be a function which is half a1 squared w1 plus b1 w1 plus c1. This is going to be half a2 squared, I mean a1 w1 squared, sorry, right? a2 w2 squared plus b2 w plus c2. And for this guy, what is the optimal step size? 1 over a2, right? For this one, the optimal step size is 1 over a1. Keep that in mind. Now here's what happens when I perform gradient descent. The gradient is orthogonal to the level set. We saw that in the class, right? So the step size is the same for every direction. So if I start off from that point WK and take a step in the direction of the gradient, I'm taking a step in the horizontal direction. I'm also taking a step in the vertical direction, but the step size is the same in both. Okay, now consider this guy. So let's say my original point solution is out here and here. If I take an optimal step size for this one, that's going to go here, correct? For the same step size, what will happen here? I'm gonna go out, right? On the other hand, if I take the optimal step size for this guy, what happens here? It becomes really small. The step size becomes really small. I'm gonna begin doing that, right? So what this means is that the step size for things to not blow up, the step size has to be smaller than twice the smallest optimal step size. You have many different directions, right? Here we only saw two. If I take a step size which is smaller than twice the optimal step size in the, na in the narrowest bowl, in one of the bowls I'm gonna blow up. One or more of the bowls I'm gonna blow up, right? At the same time, I want it to be as large as the optimal step size for the widest bowl, otherwise I'm going to take forever to get to the solution. Make, make sense, right? And so you have this, this contradiction. One of them says, if I have two directions with different step sizes, one of them says, make it as large as my optimal step size. The other says, keep it smaller than my optimal step size. And so these things sort of can have, uh, have uh, uh, this contradiction and make, that, make learning very slow, specifically what will happen. Here's an example. So in this case, in the first figure, I'm taking a step size which is lesser than, remember we have to be less than twice the optimal step size or otherwise you blow up, right? You go up. So in the first case, what can you tell me about the first guy, the top left? I'm taking steps. So is the step size greater than or lesser than the optimal step size for the vertical direction? What can you tell me? Greater than the optimal step size for the vertical direction? If it were greater, what would happen? You'd go across the optimum and then come back, right? So is this greater than or less than the optimal step size for the vertical direction? Less than. What about the horizontal direction? Greater than. So what has happened? In the vertical direction, you're sort of getting to the answer. In the horizontal direction, you're blowing up, right? And the second case, what, what is it again? It's still greater than the, lesser than the optimal step size for the vertical direction. It's equal to twice the optimal step size for the horizontal direction. In the vertical direction, you're getting to the answer. In the horizontal direction, you're bouncing around, right? In the third case, it's still, what can you tell me? It's less than the optimal step size in the vertical direction. It's less than twice the optimal step size in the horizontal direction, right? So it's coming sort of monotonically to the optimum in the vertical direction, but bouncing around and getting to the optimum in the horizontal direction. What about the fourth case? What can you tell me? Zili, what's the, what is this? Uh, it's exactly the optimal step size in the horizontal direction. So in one step, you're getting to the optimum x, but that's too slow for the vertical. So it, it's taking its time getting to the 
solution in the vertical direction. And in the last case, it's less than the optimal step size in both directions. So you can see what is happening over here, right? Your, and if you're, what is happening in this case? It's between the, it is between once and twice the optimal step size in every direction, right? So it's bouncing around in the y direction, it's bouncing around in the x direction, but slowly converging to the solution, right? So you can see what happens here. This is just to give you a pic pictorial visualization of how the whole thing operates. So this is with just two dimensions. As I increase the number of dimensions, the convergence behavior is going to become increasingly unpredictable. And for fastest convergence, ideally the learning rate must be close to both the largest optimal step size and the shortest optimal step size. So clearly that's not going to work, right? And so your convergence behavior is going to depend on the ratio of the largest optimal step size and the smallest optimal step size. The greater that is, the more difficulty you're going to have in making the algorithm converge to a solution. Make sense to everybody, right? So now here, of course, I showed you everything, assuming that the A matrix was diagonal, so the ellipses were axis aligned. If the A matrix is not diagonal, the whole figure is going to be rotated. But, and this becomes a little more complex, because when I take a step in the x direction, I'm also taking a step in the y direction. Yes? But wouldn't it make sense to uh, scale the learning rate in one direction based on the gradient in that direction? So if you're, for gradient descent, remember, the step size is the same in everything. You're sort of jumping the gun over here, but you're right, right? I can do something else. What can I do to fix this problem? Why do I have the problem here? That's not gradient descent, right? So that's a different problem, different approach. We'll get there. So but why do we have the problem here? It's nothing to do with the tilt. It has to do with the fact that the width is different in different directions. That's what all of you are saying. Can you do something else? Just look at the figure. I can, I can, yes. Who was it who said that? Joe? Yes. So repeat yourself. Normalize the data or, are you normalizing the data? Is that what you're normalizing? So Kinjal, what would you be doing? So the lady at the back without the name tag, what would you be doing? <laughs> so what is the obvious solution? I can scale the space. I can stretch the function. The problem is that the curvature is different in different directions, correct? I can make the curvature the same in every direction. If I make the curvature the same in every direction, here's what I have to do. I would have to stretch it along the x, shrink it along the y, make it a circle. Once I make it a circle, the step size is the same in every direction, right? And now I can just do gradient descent because the, uh, the perpendicular, the normal to the level set is always pointing towards the optimum, and then I can take my steps. So how do I scale it? I take W1, I scale it by some S1. I take W2, I scale it by some S2. So this is the equivalent of saying that I'm going to multiply my weights vector W by some diagonal matrix S. And this is going to scale the different directions and different, different uh, uh, coordinates in different, to different lengths. And now my optimum, my, uh, my loss function, my, uh, my, the objective is simply going to be a simple quadratic because the A, the A becomes an identity matrix. It's simply going to be half W transpose W plus B, you know, uh, plus some B, B hat transpose W plus C, right? And in this case, what is the optimum step size? Just one because the derivative is going to be one in every direction, right? This is regardless. What is this size S? What is this matrix S? It's very easy to find out what S is, right? There's the original equation on top, half of W transpose A W. Here's the modified equation at the bottom, half of W hat transpose W hat. You compare the two, what happened? A disappeared. In other words, S is going to be the square root of A, right? It's a matrix square root of A. Very simple. So you know exactly how to modify S, right? And so just by inspection, I can tell you that S is the square root of A, right? And now that I've written S as the square root of A, I can find my optimum. 
So, I can find the optimal step size and I can solve the quadratic in the scaled space, correct? And in the scaled space, my update rule, I am still assuming there is a step size. Again, remember that the optimal step size here is 1. So, in the scaled st space, the, uh, the optimal, because I have sort of gotten rid of the second derivative altogether, right? In the scaled space, the gradient descent rule is going to be simply w k, w hat k minus the derivative of the function with respect to w hat, right? So, but then if I write it down, that's simply going to be w hat k plus 1 equals w hat k minus some the step size times the gradient with respect to w hat of e, but w hat is simply a raised to half w, correct? Is going to be a raised to half w, this is k plus 1, k minus. Now, what is the derivative of e? So, again, I want derivative of e with respect to w. This is going to be, this is transposed. Don't forget the transpose. Remember, the derivative is always transpose, right? So, there is going to be the derivative of e with respect to w hat times the derivative of w hat with respect to w. Just the chain rule, which is going to be, what is that going to be? That's going to be a raised to minus half, okay? So, I can write this as if I take the transpose eta times a raised to minus half, the derivative of E transpose with respect to W, right? And then multiplying both sides by A raised to minus half, I'm going to get WK plus 1 equals WK minus eta times A raised to minus 1, the gradient of E transpose with respect to W. And this is guaranteed to get you in a single, to the solution in a single step if I use a step size of 1. Make sense to everyone? Right? It's very obvious, very simple, very trivial. Okay? And so, even if I have a quadratic, if I, so long as I scale my different directions, I should be able to get to the solution very quickly. Now, what if my function is not a quadratic? So, suppose I have a function which is ugly like this one over here. So, then I'm way behind time. I'm like half an hour behind time. So, but uh, we'll catch up on uh, Friday night or Thursday night. Anyway, so uh, what if my function is not a quadratic? If my function is not a quadratic, then I can still use the Taylor series to write an approximation to it and truncate it after the second term. And what is the second derivative of a scalar function with respect to a vector? That's your, that's your Hessian, correct? So the Taylor series is going to look like that. It's going to be the function computed at wk plus the function compute, the derivative of the function computed at wk, which is going to be a row vector times w minus wk, which is a column vector, right? And the second order term is going to be half of w minus wk transpose times the Hessian times w minus wk gives you a scalar, right? Now, this is my quadratic optima approximation. If I use this, what is the optimal step size? It's the inverse of the what? Manuel, what's the, what's the inverse of? Of the Hessian, right? Because the quadratic term, this is the, the Hessian is the equivalent of your A. So, basically what you're doing is that you're using this quadratic approximation at the bottom to the function at the top. And if you use the quadratic approximation at the bottom, then you can get to the solution in a single step. So, the equivalent of A inverse is simply going to be the inverse of the Hessian inverse, right? This is Newton's update rule, okay? And uh, what is Newton's update rule? You just assume that's a second order, co that a second order function the inverse of the Hessian is going to give you the update. So, the problem is your function is not always quadratic, right? So, if I take some function which is not quadratic and try to optimize it using this method, it turns out it works really well. 
I start off with some initial point. I make a quadratic approximation to it. When I make a quadratic approximation to it, I can get to the optimum of this quadratic approximation in how many steps? One step. Is that going to be the optimum of the function itself? No, it's going to be somewhere else, right? And now I can make a quadratic approximation out here. And then I take a single step. And then I make a quadratic approximation out there. I take a single step. And I keep doing this till I get to the solution, right? And this is guaranteed to be very fast if things work out. So this is the normalized update rule. Yes? So if, if we would assume that our function is like cubic, for example, would we potentially have a faster conversion? So if you assume I, the cubic function is not necessarily convex, right? So we sort of do, we do, do this in terms of convex functions, right? I mean, the cubic function is, it depends, right? It can look ugly, right? But anyway, it's going to be, I can't even visualize, okay. Now, for problem is for complex functions like models like neural networks, how many parameters do you have? Like even in your homework, how many parameters did you have? Thousands. So what is the size of the Hessian? Thousand squared. Now you're going to have millions. You're not going to be able to compute your Hessian. You're not going to be able to use this method. It could work, but you're not going to be able to use it. And then there's the other, for other problem, right? That if the function is not nice and convex, then this technique could just fail on its, fall on its face. So think of this. If this function has, some, has a, a crazy shape, but it's sort of somewhat like this bowl, and it has a unique optimum, gradient descent can get to this optimum. But then if I begin using the second order approximation to hasten the optimum, so let's say I'm at that, my current estimate is at the dot. There, the function is curving the wrong way. So when I make a second order quadratic approximation, the quadratic approximation is away from the optimum. And then when I take a step, instead of going towards the optimum, what happens? I actually end up going away from the optimum, right? And so this whole approach of normalizing by the Hessian has issues if the function is not convex. It, couldn't, it, it could simply not work, right? It could actually take you to the wrong place. So uh, you have this issue. First, you can't compute the Hessian. Second, even with the Hessian, it could be pointing the wrong way, meaning if it's pointing the wrong way, basically the, uh, the uh, eigenvalues of the Hessian could be uh, non-positive. So there have been many approaches prescribed in the literature we try, which try to deal with these issues. For example, the uh, BFGS tries to estimate the Hessian from finite differences, so you, so you don't have to do the big computation. Uh, the Levenberg uh, Mark Quart tries to estimate the Hessian from Jacobians, many other methods. But overall, the whole thing is too complex, so although it's very nice and beautiful theoretically, we don't actually use it. We use other methods. But then there's something else as well, right? And what is this? Much of the analysis we saw was trying to, based on trying to ensure that the step size was not so large as to cause divergence within a convex region. But is divergence within a convex region a bad thing? Not necessarily. Why so? So your actual loss function, if I take a slice, it's going to look like this, right? So let's say you start off in that local minimum out there. If your step size was nice, you're simply going to find the local minimum, which is not the place where you want to be. In the beginning, you actually want to go out, right? So you want to start off with a large step size and keep wandering around. But then is it okay to always have a large step size? No, because you'll never arrive at anything. So if you keep reducing your step size over time, eventually you'll end up in a bowl that's large enough that your step size is good for the bowl. And what kind of a bowl is that going to be? If the bowl is large and deep, it's most likely also deep, that's probably going to be a pretty darn good local minimum, right? And so what you really want to do is to start off with a large step size which actually makes things diverge and then shrink the step size. And this has the benefit that you're going to jump out of local minima and eventually find your way into a much better local minimum or even a global minimum, right? So this is, makes sense to everybody? And so here's what, what you're going to do. You're going to start off with a large learning rate, the step size. 
The step size is also called the learning rate. If you've done your homeworks, you know this by now, right? And which is greater than two if you've normalized the space, right? And then gradually reduce it with iterations. And how do you reduce it with iterations? There are many different strategies for reducing it with iterations. I'm going to st stop at the next slide. I'll go a minute over. So standard solution, linear decay. You start off with some eta zero, and in the kth iteration, if you assume that the zeroth iteration is, the, the iteration index starts at zero, in the kth iteration, you just divide by k plus one. Or you may divide by k plus one squared, or you may collapse it exponentially. Uh, more, more commonly, we do something of this kind. We, uh, we will keep the, the uh, step size, the learning rate constant for many iterations. If this is iterations and this is eta, you're going to keep the step size constant for many iterations till your loss function sort of plateaus. And then you decrease the step size by some factor and to maybe something like that. And then you keep it constant for a great number of iterations till, it, till your loss function fat plateaus. And then you decrease it again like so. Now in all of this, there's a, there's, you can't just arbitrarily do this. There are criteria. And what is the criteria? So let's say, uh, let me just draw you a function. So let's say I have some hideous function. And this is my global optimum, okay? And I start over here. And now observe that the function's derivatives are bounded, right? So I can say that f prime x is always lesser than some value b, okay? Now, what do I need to ensure that I can always find the local, the global minimum? How do I make this? I need to know that if, say, this distance, let me call this d, right? Then you want to make sure that the sum over all of your iterations of the step size times the magnitude of f prime x is greater than d. Otherwise, you're never actually going to get to that step location, correct? Because the step that you can take is going to be bounded. You're never actually going to get to that location. So in other words, the criterion you want is that is going to be infinite. You could, in, you could be infinitely far off when you start off. And so you want to make sure that your step size is actually summed to infinity. Otherwise, you may never be able, if you start off in the wrong place, you may never be actually able to reach the optimum, right? At the same time, you're, you don't want to keep your step sizes so large that things keep bouncing. You want the step sizes to shrink. So you tend to have another criterion, which is summation i eta i squared is less than some constant. The sum of the squared step sizes must be bounded. This way you make sure that you can actually explore the entire space. At the same time, you sort of converge to a solution. That makes sense to everybody, right? And so uh, if, you, if you want to find the function which, the, which is closest to satisfying both of these criteria, that's going to be 1 over k. What is the summation of 1 over k, k going from 0 to infinity? One. Anybody know? That's a harmonic series, right? That's going to sum to infinity. But if I just do 1 over k plus, e, e, k to plus epsilon, or what will it become? Or 1 over k raised to 1.0001, that's actually going to be bounded, right? So 1 over k is the boundary where the sum of the uh, step sizes is going to be infinite, where the sum of the squared step sizes are gu is guaranteed to be positive, uh, finite. And so the first guy over there actually kind of satisfies this criterion. But pretty much all of these other techniques will also give you the same guarantee to some extent. Uh, so anyway, to conclude today's portion, gradient descent can miss obvious answers, but this may be a good thing. Convergence issues abound. The loss surface has many saddle points, although not so many bad local minima. Gradient descent can stagnate on saddle points. 
vanilla gradient descent may, con may not converge or may converge too slowly. Second order, order methods normalize the variation along the components to mitigate the problem of different optimal learning rates for different components, but this requires computation of inverses of second order derivatives, which may not be feasible. Also, for non convex loss functions, this could be unstable. And finally, you know, learning rates which cause divergence may not really be a bad thing, particularly for loss functions, because it helps you uh, get out of bad local minima. What you want to do is to decay the learning rate, and, and this provides a good compromise between escaping poor local minima and convergence. We'll stop here and pick up in the next class.